Good morning, Hope. Hey, we are so excited to be here with you this morning to worship the Lord together. And as our neighbors to the south celebrate Thanksgiving, we're just in awe of how much we have to be thankful to our Lord for. And to that end, would you join me? Uh, stand for the reading of God's Word, and we're going to read Psalm 100. And it goes like this. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into His presence with singing. Know that the Lord, He is God. It is He who made us, and we are His. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. Enter His gates with thanksgiving and His courts with praise. Give thanks to Him. Bless His name, for the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever, and His faithfulness to all generations. Let's worship. Oh 
Everything will fade, everything will fade. The heavens and the earth will pass away, but you will remain. Yes, you will. thank you that we know by your word that you will not fail us. Your word never changes, and neither do you, God. And Lord, we come to you today just desperate for your presence, desperate to hear a word from you in, in trying, struggleful times. Um, we look to you, God. We trust in your word. It gives us hope. It gives us peace. It gives us strength to weather any storm. So would you fill us today and uh, just be with us through this time of worship and prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And you may be seated. Hey there, my name is Josh, and I help lead the youth ministry here at Hope Bible Church. I now want to tell you a little bit about what God is doing right here in our midst. Christmas is coming, and we are inviting you to be at the ready as we plan our Christmas outreach called Gifts of Hope. Around here at Hope, we have been saying that the mission marches on this Christmas, and now we're going to put your hands to the work available. The core teams for all the gatherings have been learning about the local needs and making plans to address them. So be ready to get involved and spread the good news of the gospel. It's important that we stay connected to the mission of God and the people of God right now. 
So we encourage you to engage and participate in the online lobby. After the service, you can watch a live interaction from either Pastor Melden or Brett on YouTube. Just go to the website, hit watch services, and you'll see the live video available. Also on our website, click online lobby to join our chat group on the Telegram app to post and see scripture, pictures of where you're worshiping, answers to prayer, and more. Don't let discouragement lead you to become disconnected. We'll see you after the service in the online lobby. Our groups this past week met online via Zoom or postponed meeting in light of the recent changes in restrictions. This week, your group leaders will be in touch to let you know how you will continue to encourage each other and spur each other on to love and good works. We also want you to take advantage of some great resources we have in our offices as strong discipleship tools for you and great gifts for others during this time. So on Thursdays, we're going to have a book table available in our office here for you to drop in and buy books for yourself and others. Just stop by between 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. At this time, Chris Gervin, the church planting pastor in Red Deer, Alberta, is going to give us an update on the ministry God is doing through this recent Great Commission Collective plant that we are partnered with. Greetings, Hope Bible Church, Kelowna. Chris Gervin here, just a quick update about our church plant here in Red Deer. Uh, so we're continuing to meet as a core group every second Sunday afternoon, uh, praying, talking about the DNA of the church, and we're seeing it grow. We're at about 24, 25 uh, adults who are committed to see this church plant happen. More people are praying and are interested about possibly joining in the future. And it's neat, God is building his church in a pandemic. And just one of the ways I can testify to that, when we uh, went to the Great Commission Collective Senior Pastors and Wives Retreat, we just shared about the church plant there. And one of the pastors sent me an email as I returned. He said, I know someone uh, who moved to Red Deer about 10 years ago. And they attended Hope Oakville before then. And uh, they might be someone to connect with, someone to pray with. I think they're pretty involved with their local church. But as I met with the guy, they've been praying for a Great Commission Collective type church for like 10 years and even asking kind of other people, hey, you should join in with this network. They're, they're so good. They just love the expositional preaching and small group ministry and discipleship. And so when I met with him, they kind of felt that COVID had kind of released them from the church that they were a part of and they're searching and looking like, Lord, where's next? And so as I talked to him, he said, we're all, we're all in. We want to see this happen. He's so excited that uh, there's a church to plant that holds to these things. Uh, that Harvest Oakville does as well, and, and you guys do as well. So it's neat, 10 years previous, God had been preparing a couple, and there's others who are praying and seeking to join too. So we're just, I got a front row seat to watch what the Lord is doing, but we'd appreciate your prayers to continue on. Uh, two specific things is one is a meeting place. Uh, we're looking at Easter 2021, a uh, place to meet on a Sunday morning. Uh, it's a strange time to look for that, but we know God will go ahead and he has a place for us, and also for someone to lead us in worship. Uh, in, in the future. So we're just looking for that. God knows who that person is. I appreciate your prayers. And we're praying for you guys as well in this strange season uh, that we continue to fix our eyes on God. He has work for us to be doing. He is still calling us to be faithful. We can't control the circumstances, but he's still building his church. He's still reaching the lost and he deserves all the glory still. So thank you so much. It's just a quick update and uh, our prayers are with you guys as well. God bless. Father God, we thank you for another day. We thank you for this time we can have together to be able to worship you. Thank you for the technology that allows us to do so in light of the uh, circumstances we're all in right now, Lord. Thank you that we can um, continue to gather and sing your praises, to learn from your word, and to hear uh, more about your gospel, Lord. I pray that our minds may, be, may, may remain focused on you during this time, Lord, that any distractions or worries or fears or anything that's going on in our heads right now can be removed and that we be able to focus in spirit and in truth on learning more about you and worshiping you uh, for the remainder of this service. In Jesus' name, amen.
trust you. Your ways are higher than our own. We trust you. We trust you. Your ways are higher than our own. We trust you. We trust you. Your ways are higher than our own. We trust you forever. We trust you. Your ways are higher than our own. This we know. We will see the enemy run. This we know. gift of grace is Jesus my redeemer there is no more for heaven now to give he is my joy my righteousness and freedom my steadfast love oh my deep and boundless peace to this I
Amen and amen to that song. Before we pray together here to, before we get into God's word, I want to just give a praise update, a prayer update for Jordan and Kelsey Vanderham. They had their young son born this past week, uh, weighing two pounds, um, three ounces, and we are rejoicing that he's doing well. So is Kelsey. And Jordan and Kelsey just give so much praise to God for answered prayer and how he has provided in some incredible ways. Now, it looks like uh, he'll be in the hospital for the next number of months, and and that's in Vancouver, but we trust that, um, and I think they hope that perhaps there would be a transfer, perhaps to the Kelowna General Hospital uh, when the time is right for that. So we give God thanks for that, that's for sure, as a church family, but we need to keep praying for this little one, and just that he would grow and develop, not only physically, but we also pray for all of our children, the children that are listening, that are watching now, that they would grow in their relationship with Jesus Christ. And uh, before we go to prayer, I want to read from Romans chapter 12. Romans 12, verse 9, it says, Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing love. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Let's pray together. And God, we just even pray right now as we gather together and as we join our hearts together in prayer, in talking to you, oh God, would this truly be a reflection of our lives at Hope Bible Church, that we would rejoice in hope, we would be patient in all tribulation, and we would be constant in prayer. And God, we just thank you so much for the answered prayer for the Vanderham baby, and we just pray for his continual growth and development and continue to uh, be with Jordan and Kelsey and the boys, three, these three sons now that they have, God, we just pray that your hand would continue to be on them. And God, would you continue to guide us as your people? I know and just believe that for so many of us, there's a weariness. Um, there's a weariness in us, uh, whether that could be caused by anger, fearful, or maybe just even an attitude of who cares, just with everything going on around us. And God, what we need is to be a people with a greater dependency upon you. 
And God, we repent of the ways that so oftentimes we live our own lives and we focus our energy and our time solely and so much on the things of this world and on ourselves and not the kingdom of God. And God, I pray that today we would be reminded through your truth in your word that we would be encouraged by a tough word in some ways as there's some tough realities facing us, but there's also some terrific joys that lay ahead for your children as well. And God, would this be a reminder today in God's word for each one of us? Would we receive the strength by your spirit as we listen and then as we apply your truth this week to live Live the truth of your word through our lives and through our lips. And indeed, would we live, yet not I, but Christ, would you live in us? Would you live in me? And day by day, would you renew us? As we come to you, would you renew us and would you give us new strength and new power, fresh every day, as we come to the one who provides lovingly in all things for his children. And we pray this all in Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen. You can take your Bibles and turn to 1 Peter chapter 4. We're in 1 Peter chapter 4. We've made it to chapter 4, and there's only one more after this. And, and uh, just, just such a great book and a timely book study for us as a church in so many different ways. And so 1 Peter chapter 4, have your Bibles, have pens. Kids, you have the kid sheets. There, it was on the online lobby today, as well as there's a way that your parents can, or you can even do it. You can go to the e-news that came into your inbox on Friday, and it's there, and you can click on that, and you can uh, get, get a copy of that and follow along, and there's questions for you to answer as we go through God's Word here today. You know, at times, hope can seem like an ideal fantasy when we hear the word hope, or hope is just a desire. It's kind of like cross my fingers, and, and we, we just sometimes just simply hope for the best. Now, I'm kind of biased, but I honestly think that hope is just a great name for a church. It just, just really is, because what is it that our world needs? What is it that you and I need? We need hope. Our world needs hope. And hope is a, a word that so oftentimes we, we see around so often and maybe don't even think about it. That's the way it was for me this week. Here's a picture just from our kind of living room, kind of hallway area, and you see that word hope showing up numerous times. You, know, you see it on our wall beside our Christmas tree, on a Christmas decoration, on a picture frame at the bottom there. And at the bottom of our stairs or at the midway part of our stairs, you see, again, on a piece of old barn wood, you see the word hope. And, 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 and so we have this word hope, and then just this past week, the tree of hope got lit up in the city of Kelowna on Highway 97. Always something to look forward to and something just so spectacular about that. And, and we're coming into this season, we call it of hope. But remember that biblical hope is more than just a sense of optimism. Biblical hope is concrete. It is rooted in the truth of the gospel. And a hope that is better than life is available to us. It is an anchor to the soul because hope has a name, and that name is Jesus Christ. And even in the wake of overwhelming circumstances and difficulties, you and I can have hope. We can have hope as families. We can have hope for our nation, all because of Jesus Christ. And that means we can have a confidence that even defies conventional wisdom. It defies worldly wisdom because of who God is and what he promises in his word and what he promises to do in our life. Now, hope or a living hope, as we are in this study together in First, in First Peter, is the theme of the book. But another theme in the book of First Peter is also the word suffering. So we have hope on one side and we have suffering. Put it together and you have this amazing letter to God's people. And suffering is something that everyone faces. No matter who you are, no matter what, what kind of a background you have, no matter what kind of job, what kind of economic status, what kind of education, doesn't matter, we're all going to face suffering. It's universal. And in our suffering, we have basically two options when it comes. To pursue biblical hope and strength, and even if we do that, and we do that sincerely, we will even experience joy in our suffering, 
Or secondly, we can walk in bitterness, disillusionment, anger or fear, and just try to forge our way through life. So we can either trust God in our suffering, we can run to him, turn to him, or we can trust in ourselves, and we will end up flatlined sooner or later. In this passage we're going to look at today, there are four passages or, or four truths that we need to download in the first six verses here in 1 Peter chapter 4. And, and we need to download these truths into our lives, into our understanding, so that they will become anchors to our souls and lead us to true and living hope even in the midst of suffering. Now, as I've been working on this message and came near towards the end of it in the last number of hours of preparation, I actually ended up not going into the final three points. We're just going to look at one point. So this isn't a pointless sermon. It has one point to it, and we're going to grind it hard because there's some great truths here in God's Word. But we're going to look at all six verses. Lord willing, we will finish the other verses next week. But we're going to read the six verses as just kind of putting it in context, but also for uh, kind of a, a little uh, soundbite for what we will get into next week. So First Peter chapter 4, verse 1. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh... Arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased to suffer from sin. So as, far to li- so, as fa- so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles do. Living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatries. With respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery. And they malign you. And they will give, but they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is why the gospel was preached, even to those who are dead, that though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way that God does. The first truth we need to download, the first truth we need to understand and to just, just come with this common realization is, is this, get ready to suffer. Get ready to suffer. It's a reality in life. And, and, and it says, since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourself with the same way of thinking. That's basically the verse, that, that's all we're going to look at today. And we have a lot to say on this, but there is so many rich truths in this verse. Now, Peter is directing our eyes to the one, Jesus Christ, to the one who has suffered. Jesus is our example when it comes to suffering. And we need to remember our Savior in how he suffered for us. And Peter is directing the eyes of the saints, and he's directing his eyes, the eyes of you and I, to Christ and to his suffering. We are to remember Christ. We are to think of Christ and what he went through. Now, basically, there are two forms of suffering that Peter refers to here in this letter, and there's one specifically that he talks about here. The first form of suffering we see overall in the book of 1 Peter is the suffering and the persecution from the government, from Rome, from the emperor Nero. Nero hated Christians. He, he, was, he, he was disgusted by them. He, he, he did not like them one little bit. He hated them, <clears throat> and this began... An emperor, empire-wide oppression, oppression that led to a brutal and bloody persecution for many Christians. It was for Peter himself, a few years after writing this, he suffered his own martyrdom because of Nero's decree. The second form, so is the form of government persecution, but now Peter here in this passage addresses another form of persecution that is sure to come our way, and, and it is this, it's from friends, from family. It's kind of the friends and family special. And it's nothing special. It is not good at all. This is the suffering that results when an individual takes a stand for Jesus Christ. 
when someone takes a stand on the truth of God's word. You see, so many Christians in Asia Minor were saved, were rescued by Jesus from a life of sinful immorality and torture. Total depravity. When you hear, and just even some of the descriptions that we just read a little bit later, or just a little bit further on there, it it was so embedded into the culture was this immorality. And for these Christians, when they came to Jesus Christ and put their faith in him, their lives, as as they determined to follow Jesus and to flee from sin and to run towards the way of Christ and and the way of the teaching of Jesus Christ, it started to bring a rub against those family, friends, neighbors, co-workers, whoever it might be, resulting in them becoming very frustrated, very angry, maligning, ridiculing, and even in some cases becoming very abusive towards these new Christians. And so Peter is telling them, be prepared for it. This is going to happen. And listen to this. I read this this week in a commentary about this day and age that they were living in. And it goes like this. In almost every region in Asia Minor, Christians faced their families and neighbors' attempts to rehabilitate them, cajole them, and pressure them to come back into a more acceptable way of life. So great pressure on the new Christian. Great pressure when someone says, I'm cutting myself off from sin. I'm running towards Jesus, and there's pressure to go back. And so Peter is reminding them, remember Jesus. Remember what he did. Remember how he suffered. Remember how he suffered in the flesh. Jesus suffered suffered at the hands of wicked political leaders. He also faced ridicule, rejection from his very own family from his own brothers and sisters, rejected him. And then he was abandoned at the most difficult and most time when he needed to have his friends around him, his own friends, his closest ones to him, abandon him in his greatest hour of need. And so they're saying, remember Jesus. When you're facing persecution, remember Jesus. When you're facing ridicule, remember Jesus. He went through it. Look what 2 Peter or 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 12 says. And, and, and Paul is writing this to young Timothy, and he says, and this is right before Paul life came to an end, before Paul was beheaded. And he said this: indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Now just leave that up on the screen for a moment. I'm just going to read verse 13, but then we're going to come back to verse 12 once again. And and verse 13 continues. It says, while evil people and imposters go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Like this is going to happen. It's going to keep happening. They're going to keep going on in this way. Evil people, imposters, it's going to happen. And and Paul is reminding Timothy, and we are being reminded that anyone who desires to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will face persecution. Because to truly live for Jesus Christ means that we're going to take a stand for Christ. And there's times that that, is, that stand for Jesus Christ is going to be applauded, and other times that, that stand for Jesus Christ is going to be maligned and ridiculed, and it won't go well. Write this down. No one escapes it. No one escapes it. Get ready to suffer because Jesus is our example, and no one is going to escape it. And whether today, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, or if you not yet have trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, you're not going to escape suffering. But we basically have three choices when it comes to our suffering. And, and here's the first, and here's the best choice. Either we suffer for Christ as one of his children, and, and in the midst of that suffering, when we suffer for doing good even, And we can experience his power, his presence, his blessing, his peace in the midst of our suffering, in the midst of our difficulty. Or there's another option, and this is for someone who doesn't believe in Jesus Christ. You can suffer without Christ, without bending that knee to Jesus Christ and Lord and Savior. You figure, I can muscle through it. I'm strong. I'm fit. I'm able to plow. Now, I've got a strong will to me. I can plow through this. I don't need Jesus. I don't need no religion. That's a crutch. You better believe it. Christianity is not a crutch. It is an ambulance, and it carries us to the one who gives us help. We need Jesus Christ. And, 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 and so you can try to pull through the suffering and the difficulties and the things that happen in your life or in your family, and here's what's going to be, be the result of all of that. 
You may pull through it, but there's going to be something else that comes. And eventually you're going to experience a life just filled inwardly with despair, with guilt over things that you've said or done or things that have happened, with an emptiness and ultimately eternal suffering in hell. That's the reality when we try to pull through life on our own. But there's also another choice, and sadly, this can be your story and it can be my story because this can be for believers in Christ. But sometimes we as believers, we don't suffer well, do we? No, we suffer poorly. And maybe it's because we're trying it in our own power and our strength and we're not running to the Lord. Or maybe it's because what we're experiencing has caused us to become angry or bitter towards God or others. We have a chip on our shoulder. And when we have a chip on our shoulder towards God or towards others, when we are angry, we're not going to experience God's power and God's strength in the midst of our suffering, in the midst of our difficulty. Or maybe it's because we're living in areas of sinfulness and disobedience towards God. When we're living in this way as, as, as God's children, we're removing ourselves away and out of his presence and his protection and his blessing. It's kind of like God is like, I see what, what's going on in your life, but I've got nothing for you. I'm not able to help you. And let's face it, we've all been there, and maybe some of you are there even right now encourage you, return, repent, come to Jesus, and just, just deal in that, those areas of disobedience or sin. Come to him for forgiveness. Come for him for cleansing. In those areas of difficulty, of anger, frustration, or just that chip that you have on your shoulder towards God or towards others, give that to him. Surrender that to him and allow him to do a work in your life so that Whatever it is that you face, we can experience and know God's power and God's blessing. Just in the lowest part of Jesus' life here on earth, we see how he called out to his father. And he eventually was rejected by his father, but we will never be rejected by our heavenly father, all because of Jesus. So here in 1 Peter, Peter is saying, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. Think, plan, plan. Prepare to suffer like Christ. This is the call that Peter is making here to, to, to the Christians then and making it for us here today. Now that word arm that you see in verse 1, it's a military term. And it means to be prepared. And, and we have to understand that we are in wartime. We have to have a battle mentality when we go through life. Now, I'm not talking about being prepared in wartime in that needing to have guns and ammo. However, it is interesting, you hear in the United States as well in Canada, gun sales are skyrocketing. In fact, a, a couple in our church just recently took a gun safety course in order to get their gun license, and, and the instructor told them he has never been so busy since COVID. And he's just, just in unprecedented ways, he's so busy. People are scrambling to do this. Now, Peter isn't telling us to arm ourselves with guns and ammo, even though that might sound kind of cool. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about a spiritual battle. And, and a, a spiritual battle where we are up against the world, the flesh, and the devil, and they're coming for us. And they come hard in different ways, in, in, in different waves even, in, in our lives, come, coming hard at believers in Christ. And just as soldiers are to get ready for battle, they, go, uh, they undergo strict training, very precise, very detailed, and then they gear up. They're geared up for battle. They, have their, they put on their army fatigues or their combats or, or their camo, whatever it might be. And, and speaking of camo, I always kind of chuckle a little bit when I see cars, that like just normal cars or trucks or Jeeps, and people you know, kind of deck them out with all camo paint or camo sticker or whatever it might, might be, and it's just like, you know... Uh, Oh, uh, I can't even see your vehicle. You know, you've just done so well. But look at this person that wrapped their car in camel. It's amazing. Just take a look at this. Isn't that amazing? They didn't do the bumper, but you can see the rest of it. And that's just so awesome to be able to, to, be able to see it. Anyways, uh, you need a meme every Sunday, I believe. I, I just think that's part of good, healthy preaching. <laughs> well, maybe not. But uh, when you find these, you just sometimes have to share them. Anyways, uh, but... but we are to arm ourselves for battle, and we are to dress ourselves in, 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 with a spiritual armor through the armor of God that we read about in Ephesians 6. And church, 
loved ones in Christ, we must be prepared. And we must not be shocked when suffering and even when persecution comes. Peter says, just a few verses down, if you look down to chapter 4, verse 12, he says, do not be surprised by the fiery trials when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. You know, so oftentimes when suffering and trials come, we think, hey, I didn't sign up for this. But Peter is saying, be prepared for it. Be ready for it. Don't be surprised. Instead, he's telling us, prepare for it. J.I. Packer, great man of God who's now with Jesus, said this, the Christian's motto should not be let go and let God. So oftentimes you go, oh, just got let go and let God. No, it's trust God and get going. I like that. Trust God and get going. And so we must prepare. We must prepare for this battle. How do we prepare? First of all, we prepare mentally for this battle. And, and, and it's kind of interesting how the me- mental is used in so many different ways. Uh, in sports, uh, football players memorize and they have to know detailed plans and plays so that when the quarterback calls out that play and even changes it just as, as he's lining up before he huts the ball and, and, and he's changing the cadence and that they need to know when this play is given, I need to go there. Race car drivers will, will memorize and, and, and study and visualize the track that they're racing. They know every crook, crook and cranny. They know every turn, every curve, every bump. They know the track so well. They study it. They learn it. I, I talked to a professional hockey player that I know, um, a, a goalie, and, and, and I asked him, and some of you may know him too, and, and he said, I asked him, what role does the mental take when it comes to playing goal in the NHL? And, uh, and, and his response was this, and he says, well, it's kind of a joke, but he says, it's not really a joke. He says, the goalies oftentimes will, will say that mental is 110% of their work in order to do it that plays 110% of their play in the crease to to play goal in in hockey. And he says, and the rest of it is physical. So 110 mental and the rest of it is physical. That the mind matters in so many different ways. And the mind matters in, in, in so many other things. But ultimately, when it comes to the spiritual battle, our mind matters. The the battle starts right here in the mind. Battles are won and lost there. In, in your mind, in our mind. And we need to focus with clear and proper thinking. And, and in chapter 1, verse 13 of 1 Peter, Peter even said, prepare your minds for action. We have to be ready for this. Be, be ready mentally. And let's face it, this world is becoming a lot more hostile towards biblical Christianity. So different than 5, 10, 15 years ago. Today, just state or share or post What the Bible says, and you agree with it in regards to things like abortion or homo or heterosexual immorality, about gender reassignments, state the fact from God's word that Jesus is the only way to God, expose the error in a false teaching or a false doctrine, tell your friends, your family, your co-workers that you are no longer wanting and you're no longer going to... participate in questionable or ungodly, unbiblical activities, or at work, take a stand and and refuse to sign a statement that endorses lifestyles or ideologies that you cannot support biblically as a child of God, or perhaps in school you are told to participate in certain mindfulness, certain activities that go against God's word, and you do that, you do any of those things, get ready for the fur to fly. And we're such a triggered... uh, society these days get ready to be vilified not just not respected just oh yeah you're entitled to to your own way your own thinking no if for the most part you'll be vilified you'll be mocked ridiculed you'll be fired taken a task overlooked for for advancement in in your job you'll lose contracts for this whatever it might be even persecuted and the day is getting closer and closer where parts of the bible will be considered hate speech I hear more and more pastors talking about the fact that they could see themselves at one point going to jail and being charged for preaching what God's word has to say. 
Vody Bachman is a pastor in the United States, and, and, and he made this statement, and, and I read it here to you because you need to chew on this. This is really interesting. He says, suffering is universal. We've already touched on that. No one escapes it. Persecution is optional. All you have to do to avoid persecution is compromise or stay silent. Persecution is suffering with a choice. You do not have to worry about persecution if you compromise or you stay silent. But we are not to remain silent as followers of Jesus Christ. We are called to speak and live the truth of God's word in love. It's not about living and, 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 and speaking. We can live and speak our own personal convictions. But when it comes to spiritual persecution that we're facing, they've got to be based on the truth of God's word. And we are called to speak God's word in truth and in love. And the Western church, for, for many, many decades, for centuries, has avoided and has been spared persecution that much of the other civilized world has encountered. In the last century alone, there has been more people martyred for their faith in Jesus Christ than all other centuries combined. Thousands a year will die for their faith in Jesus Christ. Millions more will encounter varying degrees of repetitive, persistent, and systematic suffering and deprival of basic human rights simply because they have placed their faith in Jesus Christ. A great website to look at is Voice of the Martyrs. And, and, and uh, you can just, j- just do a search on that and you'll be able to, to just be encouraged and, and challenged by, by the faith and how people are taking stands for Christ all over the world. And in North America, I believe very much, and, and, and many others, you would agree with me that the storm clouds are rising. And we need to be informed, we need to be aware, and we need to be, as we're talking about here, we need to be prepared. We need to be prepared with understanding. The philosophies and the ideologies that are being paraded in the media, in entertainment, in schools, in governments, it's very, very alarming what is taking place. Radical secular strategizing on how they can, can just continue to keep selling that which is evil and, and selling it as good, and taking what is good and selling it as evil. My uncle has written this book, uh, and, and I believe it is a sobering wake-up call. And uh, we still have copies. Many of you have pre-ordered it, and those orders are in at the office, but we still have some copies, and we're ready to order more if we, we need, need to be. This gives a good, comprehensive understanding of history. First of all, when it comes to uh, the history of, of, of persecution and suffering and different things that we can learn from history, but also a very eye-opening look at what is taking place in our society today through ideologies and philosophies and how we as the church need to wake up We need to wake up and do what Jesus said in the book of Revelations when he was talking to the church of Sardis, where he said, wake up and strengthen what remains, repent, and we gladly take up the cross for Jesus Christ, our Savior and our King. You see, for decades here in the West, Christianity has been promoted as an upgrade to your current life, a way for you to experience your best life now. And, and then at the end, you get heaven when you die. Or it's been sold as, come to Jesus, and there will be ease and comfort and constant happiness, and people will just love you, and you'll go to heaven when you die. Or come to Jesus, come to church, it'll be good for you, it'll be good for your reputation, good for your re- career, good for your business, good for your social standing, and you get to go to heaven when you die. That's what we've been, been, been buying and that's what's been sold across the pulpit so oftentimes in North America for, for decades now. And I've heard some statistics that um, just more recently that there are those that believe that the North American church is, will, shrink by up to 30 to 40% from the pre-COVID days once we get through this. Perhaps it's a timely and a necessary and a yet sad sifting. The more it costs to follow Christ, the more difficult it becomes, the leaner and the stronger and stronger the church must become. 
We need to align ourselves with the expectations of what God's word actually teaches which reminds us and tells us to prepare for suffering. We must align ourselves with the call of Jesus Christ. When he was calling his disciples and he was instructing them, and as he's instructing his disciples today through the word of God, in Matthew 16, in Luke 9, in in, in Mark 8, we see in the Gospels, he says, if anyone would come after me, they must first deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. You see, a cross isn't simply a nice piece of jewelry or symbol that we may have in our house or some people may have in their car to be kind of like almost like a good luck charm. That's not what it is. It is a call. The cross is a call and a reminder that we must be also willing to die. It's what Christ has done for us, but in order to follow him, we must die. Die to our ways, our wants, our desires, to the things of this world, and ultimately live for his kingdom. To die to, 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 to what society says, what others say, what peer pressure says, and to follow Christ. And we look and learn, we see this all through Jesus, how he suffered, how he was accused, how he was spit upon, how he, a crown of thorns was placed on his head, and yet he did not retaliate. There were no snippy comments from the Savior when he was going to the cross. Just a heart of love. And even as his arms were stretched out on that cross, his words were, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. In 1 Peter chapter 2, 23, we covered this some time ago. It says, when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to the one who judges justly. And the good news of this, as we do this as well, as we we see what's going on, as we experience different things at the hands of, of, of people who may love us or people who do not love us, yet we entrust ourselves We don't fight back. We don't ridicule. We don't return evil for evil. When threatened, we don't threaten in return. No, we entrust ourselves to the one who judges justly. And this is so hard because in so many of us, there's so much fight. We want to fight. We want to strike back. But we must learn from the master and what he calls us to do. And the good news is, is that his strength, as we abide in him, his strength becomes our strength. And it's available to us through his Holy Spirit. And so we must prepare. We must prepare mentally. But second of all, we must also prepare spiritually. We must prepare spiritually for suffering. Verse 1 again, arming ourselves with the same way of thinking. This implies taking diligent care. But this is going to happen, taking care of ourselves spiritually and preparing spiritually. It's not going to happen automatically. We must cultivate a life of constant daily disciplines. That is why our very first G in the 5G life of our discipleship model here at our church is God time daily. That is crucial. It is absolutely crucial for us to abide in Christ and for us to know his power and his strength in our life. We need to be in his word. We need to be communicating with him in prayer. We need to be memorizing and knowing his word. It's involving ourselves in personal worship, just enjoying God's presence and allowing his word to shape our lives. And so this way, when we do this we won't be so greatly impacted or ruined by the news or about what or by what we see on social media or on youtube videos or predictions about what is coming down the road it's so easily to get discouraged so easily to get destroyed in this it's so easy to get bent out of shape in these different areas and so we must be aligning and filling our minds with the word of god and maybe some of you, just an encouragement, just, just a loving correction and a loving uh, just consideration. Maybe some need to consider pausing or canceling your Facebook, your Twitter, your social media. Maybe it means unfollowing certain people or pages because it just riles you up and you're in it for a fight and it's not good for your soul. It's causing you more angst and anger than anything else. If what you're reading or hearing or replying to or is getting you angry and anxious and causing you to not reflect the love and the character of Christ, get off for the sake of Christ, but also for your sake. But we can become so addicted and and think it's our calling to do this. No, our calling is to be on mission for Jesus Christ, to to share with with lost people the wonderful hope that we have in Jesus Christ and to reflect his love and his character. And so we get to the word, we get worshiping, we get our eyes on Jesus. Then we, and and as we do this, we get to better know his heart. And we get to see more and more. We have an understanding of what's going on around us. And and, and we have a sure confidence because knowing whatever it is that we're facing, that God is with us and he is for us and he's going to see us through and he can work it out for good. 
And we have the promise in Isaiah 40 that, that reminds us that strength rises, that we get stronger. The weak become strong as we wait upon the Lord. And so we need to prepare spiritually. And third and last, we need to prepare communally. We need one another. Christianity is about a personal relationship with the Lord. That's where it starts. But Christianity isn't just simply about a personal relationship. It's not about, oh, I have a private faith. No, it's a communal faith. You're in community. It's corporate. The lone wolf is a dead wolf. They need a pack, and so do we. You and I need one another. We need one another to study and learn God's word, to grow in Christ-likeness, to, to, to grow in self-control, in patience, in accountability, in, in community, to pray for and with one another, to encourage one another. And, and that's why the interaction that we encourage so much for you to be a part of the online lobby on Sundays and just kind of sharing and bantering and posting pictures of what you're doing and what you're involved in, we, we just so encourage you to do that where you're watching and pictures of your family or what you're doing throughout the day because that's what we do in a chat you know, what we do in a lobby if we were meeting we get to know what's going on in people's lives what they're doing that afternoon this is a way we can share that we can keep community growing and continuing in this way and 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 then throughout the rest of the week that's on sundays there are various other chats that 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 men that women can be a part of and and, and, and just a reminder, these are not another form of social media, but this is a way for us to be able to share God's word, get so blessed when, when in, in one of the men's chat or a number of the chats that I'm in, when, when, when someone shares a scripture verse, I take and read that. If it was important to them for them to post it, I'm going to take and read it. And it so blesses me. So many, and sometimes it's just the reminder and the encouragement I need. And we need to encourage one another and press on together in various ways, encouraging and supporting one another the best that we can. And, and, and our hope for, for us at, at, at Hope Church, even in this confusing time, is to continue to keep growing in community with one another. The groups are still going on, and your leaders, as Josh mentioned just a little bit ago, that your leaders will be in touch with you about the plans for this week. And sadly, we're, we're we, such mixed emotions about not being able to gather on Sundays. And, and you and I, we need to be praying. Would we be praying? Encourage you to take time this week to fast and to pray. And to pray that God would, would make a way of, for, for our government leaders to, 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 to fully understand the grasp of what's going on, that they would respond in wisdom and, and in, a way, in a godly way and in a loving way for those that have elected them and, and, and the positions that they hold. But would you be praying for us as church leaders as well? We have a core conviction here at Hope that gathering is important. It's one of our G's. We have God time daily. We have gather time weekly that we want to gather together with God's people. And I already mentioned about group time, about being involved in groups together. And, and let's face it, I'll be honest with you. It's a lot easier to go to church sitting on your couch. It just is. It's just a lot easier to roll out of bed, make a coffee, don't you have bed head. Or maybe even some of you, even right now, you're in bed and you're watching this. Get out of bed already if you are. Like, no, just, just get up, get out, unless you're sick, then you can stay in bed and that's a good place for you to be. But if you're watching this in bed, get out and at least just go sit on the couch. Because yes, to meet physically, it's a lot more difficult. It's more work. Not only to get up, get kids going, get out the door, make it in time, travel to wherever you're going to. And for those that are involved in serving, different, it's a lot more work, but it's worth it. And it's biblical, and it's a command, and it's something God tells us to do. And so we miss it when we're not able to. And our church leadership, like many of you are concerned, and, and we've heard from, from many of you just your concern in this area about the latest restrictions. Just, it seems they've just gone too far in, in restricting corporate worship. And your leadership at Hope, we're not taking it passively, we're taking it prayerfully, and we're exploring various options. This past week spent many hours in discussions, in meetings, in prayer, in networking, in emailing, um, in, in, amongst ourselves, but also with other church leaders, uh, some at the coast, some here locally. There's going to be more meetings, going to be another busy week this week as we just consider, okay, we've got to be really careful how we approach this, but it's also, too, we, we can't let go of this conviction that we sense that, that the Lord, well, that we see in God's word for us. And, and so regardless, though, of the outcome of that, we desire to still press on one way or another. And, and the, the mission of God that God has given us, we're going to 
we desire to keep pressing on and, and, and to be faithful in that, to, and be faithful until God calls us home. And, 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 and yet we believe we must do this together as the body of Christ. And so this morning, as we bring this to a wrap, and, and we've only covered this one point, and this reminder to get ready to suffer, it can sound kind of discouraging, but suffering and persecution for the Christian and for the church can also serve a good and a godly purpose. It can actually be a very beautiful life. You see, throughout the history of the church, the persecuted church is often the most powerful and the fastest growing church in the world. It is a place where God's presence and God's power is experienced in just miraculous ways. You say, why or how, how does this happen? And it's because suffering, whether it's just personal suffering that, that, that we're going through, and, and many of you would give testimony to this, or whether it's, it, it's a larger suffering that we're, we're going through, it gives us laser focus. It should, it ought to give us laser focus on what really matters. And what ends up happening is lukewarmers, people who are lukewarm in the faith, will either get red hot or they'll get colder than cold. Fence setters will jump in or they will jump out. And there's a purification that ends up taking place and, and a zero in a laser focus about what really matters. One of the men on the men's chat this past week shared that he heard about just how in China where communism is ruling the country and there's so many tight restrictions on Christians in the church, the evangelical church is growing exponentially. It's amazing what's taking place. And this got me looking at a website called operationworld.org. Great website, check it out, operationworld.org. And it shows that amidst great persecution, Iran is the fastest growing church with a growth rate year over year of 20% in the evangelical church. Some stats say that 3,000 new converts are baptized every month in Iran where to believe in Jesus Christ is illegal. Canada is on the list, far down on the list, when it comes to some of the, being one of the slowest countries for the growth of the evangelical church at 0.8%. I heard recently of a, of a pastor, and actually pastors in China, who pray for the North American church, saying that we have it so tough here because we are not being persecuted. You see, when difficulty comes, and maybe you're in that place right now, difficulty or illness, financial crisis, when suffering, when persecution comes, it forces us to be all in. And, and, and we have no other place to turn but to Jesus. Well, we can try to live it on our own, but we're not going to make it. We're not going to make it very well. But when Christ becomes our all, our all in all, when he becomes our devotion, then he's like, now I got your attention. Now I got you. There's so many other distractions and now you're focused in. Now he says, now I got you where I want you. Let me walk with you. Let me empower you. Let me strengthen you. Let me give you hope. And if we allow God to work in whatever circumstances we are facing, when we surrender to his will and his ways and say, God, you are God and I am not, I surrender to you, it can become one of the greatest blessings as it refines, as it retools us, as it renews us, and gives a growing and a building faith and confidence and reliance and hope in Jesus. I pray that we would be willing to do that, each one. That we would be ready to count the cost. That Christ would be our all in all devotion. I read this this week, that biblical historical tradition states that just before Peter was crucified upside down, that his wife was crucified just before him. And as she was dying, he was calling out to her, Remember the Lord! Remember the Lord! Folks, loved ones, whatever you are facing today, remember the Lord. Remember his love. Remember how he suffered and how he conquered for the joy set before him endured the suffering knowing there would be glory on the other side. And the same is promised for you and for me. Let's pray together. God, in the midst of suffering, in the midst of difficulties, we can become so self-centered. We get so worried about the future. We get so worried about our family. 
We get so worried about what other people think. Yet scripture declares to us that the best remedy for going through suffering is to become more and more like Jesus, to be a Christ-centered people. Would we remember the Lord? Would we remember the Lord this week? When we're watching the news, when we're scrolling, when we're researching, when we're looking at things, oh God, would we remember the Lord and would we get to the word and would we worship and would we put our faith and our trust and our confidence in you? Would we choose this day to follow you? Would we decide even now, Jesus, I'm going to follow you. Follow you no matter what. No turning back, no turning back. Would that be the prayer and the cry of our hearts today? Would we remember the Lord? Everything I need. 
be the cry of our heart, no turning back, that Christ would be enough. I want to just trust that you have a wonderful week. Your small group leaders, those of you that are in groups, uh, your group leaders will be in touch with you about your group meetings this week. If you're not in a group, you can go to the online connection card, fill it out. We'd love to get you into a group as well. Encourage you to, um, you can go on the online lobby, and or not the online lobby, but on the online connection card, and you can just fill out a little reserve. Hey, I'd like to uh, reserve one of these books. As I said, we have one of them, and we need to be informed, and this is just a very uh, good read, helping us to understand from a biblical perspective what is going on. Also, to encourage you now, uh, as the service comes to an end, to click on the online lobby, and there will be a YouTube video that will be running live that will be hosted. I believe it will be by Brett, and uh, he will be leading that this week, and, and just he will banter on a little bit and show his kids uh, and what they're up to, and you can uh, get on your online lobby Telegram app, and let's just chat with one another and just share with one another uh, just just what we're doing this day and also just um, if you have prayer requests if you have praise items let's just keep loving and caring and walking for and with one another all right so you have a wonderful day we'll see you on the lobby um, remember in all things you are loved